Welcome to another message in Systematic Theology from discovertheword.com. We're in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. We're studying about eschatology. And eschatology means last things. Last things. We're going to start with verse number 7. I'm going to read it, translate it to you from the Greek, and maybe comment on the Greek word now and then. But before I do this, in the book of Revelation, Jesus has many titles. We know that Jesus fulfills all of the Jehovah titles. Adonai Ha'avanim, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Now, in the book of Revelation, it talks about different titles that he has, and we're going to talk about that in this lesson tonight. He's called the Alpha and Omega in Revelation 1 and 8. He's called the Lord God, uh, what we call El Shaddai, or uh, Jehovah Jireh. He's called the Lord of Armies, the Lord of our banner. Uh, he's called El Shaddai. And in Revelation 1 and 8, it uses all these Hebrew titles because John is a Hebrew. And so John brings these Hebrew titles into the Greek language and, of course, now into our English language. He's called the Alpha and Omega. He's called Lord God. He's called the Almighty. Jehovah Elohim. He's called the Son of Man. Of course, he was the Son of Man because he's our Redeemer. He's called the First and the Last, the Alpha and the Omega. He's called the Living One. He's called the Son of God. He's called the Faithful Witness. He's called the Creator because He is. Colossians 1 and 8 tells that. John 1 and 1. He's called the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. The Lion of the Tribe of Judah. He's called the Root of David. He's called the Lamb of God. He's called the Shepherd. In the 7th chapter in verse 17, He's called Christ. 12 and verse 10. He's called the faithful and true, 19 and verse 11, and also Adonai Ha'adonaim, the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He's called the Word of God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's called the bright and morning star. All of these titles are Christ's titles. If you go all the way down, go to discovertheword.com and look at the titles, uh, of the titles or the names of God and what they mean, you'll see all of them in Hebrew. Now, we're talking about the church at Philadelphia. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Philadelphia. Philo and Adelphos. Philo and Adelphos. Philadelphia was founded by the citizens of Pergamum. The community was built in a frontier area as a gateway to the central plateau of Asia Minor. Philadelphia's residents kept barbarians out of the region and brought in Greek culture and language. The city was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 17. Now, this is during Christ's lifetime. And the aftershocks kept people by fear from building in the city, in the old city of Philadelphia. But it becomes a very important city because now this period of time covers from 1638 to 1812. What happened between 1638 and 1812? By the way, I've got my little magic pointer here with a little red dot on the end of it. Here we have between 1600 and 38 and 1812, we have Luther, we have Calvin, we have the Augsburg Confession of Faith, we have the Congregationalist begun, we have the Church of England begun, we have John Bunyan, we have Zwingli, during this period of time and we have a Methodist coming out of the Church of England. 
every one of these groups of people, but we have one stable group that came all the way from Galilee, all the way to the end of the church age. All the way from Galilee to the end of the church age, which will be right over here. They're called Anabaptists, they're called Paulicians. In America, we have the Amish, and we have the Mennonites that came from these people. The Amish and the Mennonites migrated from Asia Minor, where this church was. The seven churches of Asia was a hotbed of churches. Now, True churches are forbidden in all of this area because it's the Islamic nation. It's part of the caliphate. It's part of a Turkey. And now no longer can the truth be shared. Verse number seven. And to the messenger, the pastor in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia church. These are all of those people that had anything to do with the propagation of the gospel during that time. This is when the great missionaries began. I won't say a whole lot for John and Charles Wesley. This was kind of, a, this is really funny. They came to America to establish Methodist churches and we have the, the circuit riding Methodist going around on the donkeys and the, and the mules, riding their circuits. But when John and Charles came, Wesley came to America, they did not know the Lord yet, personally. Their system, their, their religion was a system of study. They came from the Church of England. The Church of England came from the Catholic Church by way of Henry VIII. They came out of there and they said, we have a system of studying the scriptures. And it was a holiness movement. This is where the holiness movement came from originally. Out of the Methodists came the Pentecostal churches, the fire baptized Methodists. I mean, sometimes some of you people may not even know what I'm talking about at all. But this is where the origin of all this was, and it was all a holiness movement. These are the people, the women wore their hair, the men wore their clothes in such a way especially the women. They would not wear jewelry or anything. And during this period of time, John Charles Wesley came to America. And when they went back to England, they went to a revival meeting of a Baptist preacher. And both of them at that time came to a personal revelation of repentance. Not that they were so good. See, before, they're living above sin. But now we come to the point in time when people look at God and see how small you are because you're a sinner. Many religious people say, well, I'm good. You don't get good until God makes you white with the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you do that, then you must come to know that you are a sinner. A sinner. And the only way that you will ever come to the presence of God is by believing in Jesus Christ, asking Him to forgive you of your sins, and when you don't think you've got sins, then you've got a problem. And that's what's wrong with the holiness movement. They are living above sin. Their perfection will bring them into the presence of God, but that's not the story, people. It's repentance and believing and begging for mercy and forgiveness by the person or through the person of Jesus Christ. Unto the messenger of the pastors of churches of Philadelphia write these things. These things, he says, the Holy One, the Holy and the True, the One Holy and the One True, the One having the key of David, the One having the key of David, and opening and no one shall lock and shutting, and no one shall open. It is not 
by works of righteousness that you go to heaven. It's by the person of Jesus Christ and Him only. Jesus has the key to eternal life. Jesus said, no man comes unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. And he said, I will draw all men unto the Father. The Bible says also that there's only one intercessor, one go-between, between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. Our only hope of salvation is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for the sins of all mankind. But unless you ask Him to save your soul and forgive your sins, it is not efficacious to you. You shall answer for what you did with Jesus' blood. The truth. Now, the key of David and the one locking and no one opening. These are Hebraisms, grammatically. The book of Revelation is written in Greek, but it is full of Hebraisms. Full of Hebraisms. The Gospel of John is full of Hebraisms. In our came, ho logos, kai ho logos, ain't pros, on theon, kai ho logos, ain't theos. John 1 1. In beginning, kept on being the Jehovah. The word there is Jehovah. That's halavar in Hebrew. That's the. That is the replacement for the word Job because they're afraid to speak it. So they call him the Halavar, the word. Ahashem, the name. That's Hebraism. Kahologo sarks again. So, and the word and the Jehovah fleshy became and dwelt among us. The word Jehovah in Hebrew comes from the word Hayah, which means to become. The word Jehovah means the one who shall become. John's writings are full of Hebraisms, and the book of Revelation is no different. Matter of fact, many scholars, or Greek scholars, thought the book of Revelation was so mixed up in grammar that it couldn't be inspired and it couldn't be of God. When you realize that John knew exactly what he was doing when he was breaking the rules of grammar, he was writing in Hebraisms. We need to think with the Hebrew mind in his writings. The key of David, the authority of King David. Jesus is the seed of, from the seed of David. The seed of Jesse. All the way back, he's the seed of the woman. In Genesis, the third chapter, verse 13. Verse number 8. I have known you, the works of you, your products of employment. What do you do? What do you do with your life? Every one of us, God gives time to. I thought my time was running out yesterday. I went into hypoglycemia extreme. I wish you would pray for me because I always have this problem. Sometimes when I'm preaching, I'm just almost flat on the floor. I try not to show it. But it can come upon me just like a whammo. I have low blood sugar. I don't have high blood sugar. Sometimes I wish I had a high blood sugar. I wouldn't have to worry with this. I almost go out. My heart rattles around my chest and I know I go, in, I go into shock, shaking and my teeth chattering and quivering even when it's hot. It's a miserable thing. That's my thorn in the flesh. Paul had one too. Maybe it was hypoglycemia. I don't know what it was. But please remember you and me in your prayers. I have known the works of you, the products of employment. Each and every one of us have gifts. Not like we have abilities. We have abilities. Communication. Working. Loving people. Praying for people. We need to use those gifts, whatever God's given us. It's a work. Mm -hmm. It's a gift. We need to use them. Mm -hmm. I, with all this building here, I have not preached as much as I wanted to. And I feel like I was letting God down. I've always, always preached as much as any preacher ever always does. I preach at least three or four times a week. 
But I'm used to preaching seven or eight times a week and putting some word out there so you can, it will feed the sheep. Because some of you people in foreign lands, behind the Islamic curtains, this is all the preaching you get. Please pray that we'll get this all over with and I'll be able to do more, get into traces again and plod along. The works. You behold, I have given before you an open door. A door having been opened. How does the door of salvation, how is the door into the kingdom of God, how did it open? Jesus said, I am the door, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man come unto the Father except by me. Which no one is able to lock, shut down. That word is clase. That word no one has the key to. You people out there that think you're holy enough to walk into the presence of God, that's not the key. That's not the key. The key is the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because you have a little power, and you, uh, and you guard the word of me, and not you deny it for yourself the name of me. People down to the church age, all the way from the seashores of Galilee to the end of the church age. Many people have paid the cost of life. They've suffered and they've died. They've been tortured. They've lost everything. Why the churches of Jerusalem? You know, we look at the Great Commission and says, Go ye therefore. The Great Commission doesn't say, Go ye therefore. After you've been run off, after you've been scattered, what do you do? Make disciples. How do you do that? By preaching the word. What do you do with those disciples? You baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them to guard with their lives all things that I've handed unto you. That's our command. Our command is to preach. It's not go ye, therefore we're going to be scattered. That church was going to be scattered throughout the world. By persecution, it would be going out there. Not, go ye therefore, but after you've been kicked out, after you've been run off, after you've been persecuted, after you've been scattered, make disciples. And those disciples will be tormented also. <coughs> I'm the door. I'm the life. I'm the truth. You don't have any power. You guard my word. Yeah. And I understand you that you have not denied my name and my authority. Verse number nine. You behold, I give out of the synagogue of Satan of the ones saying to themselves they are Jews to be. And not they are, but they lie. They keep on lying for themselves. They say, well, we're the sons of God. We're, we're, the, we're the children of Abraham. Jesus told them one time, he said, God can raise up these stones, children of Abraham. You're nothing. <clears throat> Polish their buttons. I'm a Jew. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The Jews are downtrodden and cast off right now, people. God will call them back again one of these days, but it's not because of them, it's because of the promise. The promise to David, the Davidic promise, and the Abrahamic promise. It has nothing to do with their bloodlines. God promised David, he promised Abraham, there will be a king on the throne of Israel again one of these days. Behold, I shall make them to fall down and to worship before your feet. And they shall know that I have loved you. God loves his little old feeble churches. Feeble churches, little churches, little castaways all during this time. 
verse number 10. Because you have kept and you guarded my word, you know that the Catholic Church and the Islamic world tried to destroy the word of God. They forbid it to be preached in the original languages. It can only be preached and used in Latin. Baptists kept on preaching it. Baptists kept on copying it. The Islamic Caliphate tried to destroy and burn every page of the Bible they could find. The Catholic Church tried to do the same thing. The Catholic Church would burn people with their Bibles. Islam would crucify them. Like the Lord was crucified. We're owning a Bible. And yet today, in the Greek language, the original language of the Bible, the New Testament. There are enough manuscripts left behind. How many were burned? A lot more than we have. They wrote, they erased them and wrote over them. Palmasets. They found some of the oldest pages of the Bible had how they were erased and written over by somebody's grocery list or something. They find these things. And of the ancient manuscripts, there's enough of those manuscripts to pile from this floor to over a mile high. That's left. Their word of God was guarded with their lives. The Baptist pastor, at one time when the Bible was forbidden, had to memorize all four Gospels and the Psalms in the original language. That's quite a qualification, people. How would you like to be in a church that only had one page, one leaf of the Bible? And all you could do is depend upon your pastor to, to, and his memory to tell you everything else besides that one page. The Paulicians were called the Paulicians because they had all the writings of Paul. They guarded the Word of God. And we have it today because of the lives and the blood of those people. Because you have guarded my word. You've remained under the strain. And I shall also guard you and keep you from the hour of tribulation. The one being about to come upon the whole earth. The inhabited entire earth. And the dwelling place of the earth. Now men... We protect and guard our wives and our children from the harm. We should, anyway. Our Lord loves his bride. And he said, I'm going to keep you from the hour of tribulation. And during this church age, no, they would not go to tribulation. They won't. The one in the next church age are going to see the tribulation come. The Lord guards and protects his faithful bride from that hour also. He shall snatch them out of danger. That's the word rapture, rapture. Harpage. In his parousia coming, in his epiphania. Apocalypse. It means to snatch away. Ru'omene. Ru'omene. To snatch away, I shall snatch you out of the hour of tribulation. Then he says in verse of the letter, I come suddenly. The word suddenly there is taxi. Erkamai taxe krate ha e kes. Hina me deis labe ton stephanon su. I thought it wouldn't read much Greek, I'm reading a little bit of it. I come suddenly. We got our word taxi comes from that word taxi. And you hold on tenaciously to what you have. Or no one 
may take it from you, may take the crown from you. The word crown there, cephalos, that's a garland. <clears throat> it's a crown. This cephalos is a crown that's given by right of birth and sometimes by right of conquest. The word diadema, that is the word crown also, a diadem. And that one is won by conquest only. This one here is by conquest, but also by inheritance. In the Greek games, they would give a to the to the winners. They would give a garland of olive leaves, and that would, that crown would be a fading crown. A warrior that would come out and come into a city. You'll see many of the, of the Greeks in ancient history in the, in the, in the statues of the, of the Romans, you'll see them wearing this garland of olive leaves. Because they won a battle. They did something tremendous, some famous thing. The word diadema is totally different. Now the crown is Stephanos is a symbol of victory in military might and valor. It's a celebration. It's made of oak, ivory, parsley, myrtle, olive leaves, roses, violets. In German it's called crowns, in Latin it's called corona. It's a sign of royalty and a sign of honor. A person can be deceived out of this reward. This reward. Don't let anyone take that reward from you. Don't let the devil steal this reward from you. It's not eternal life. This is a reward. A reward. Let's go on again, verse number 12 and 13. We'll go back and read it from the Amplified or from the New American Standard. The one conquering, I shall make him a pillar, a pillar in the temple of God, of me, and out no not he may go out any longer, and I shall write upon him the name of my God, the name of my God. The name of Jehovah was written upon the priest's crown. Myers, belonging to Jehovah. People, it is a great honor to wear a crown belonging to the Lord. The brand of the owner is a great brand to wear. You know, the slaves in the Old Testament, if they, were, if they were a free Jew and they had been sold into slavery by poverty or whatever, after so many years they had to turn them loose. They couldn't remain a slave. They didn't have to remain a slave. But if a man loved his master so much that he did not want to be released, that he wanted to live with his master's home, and be a servant of the one that he loved. They would take him to the doorpost and they'd pull his ear out and they would take an awl and punch a hole in it. In his ear. Testifying that we belong to our Lord and that servant belonged to his Lord. It is an honor to wear the brand of our Savior and have his name written upon us. Verse number 12 says, And of me, in the name of the city of God, of me. And New Jerusalem, the one coming down out of the heaven from God, from my God, and the name of me is going to be a brand new name. I'm going to get a brand new name. There have been many perversions of this in time. Many perversions of this. This new name in the Mormon church, 
when a man and a wife get married, they have a new name. They, they, they have a new name. And only the man knows that woman's name. And if he's pleased with her in life, a woman has no eternal life in the Mormon church. But if the man is pleased with her, then he calls her. They bury her with a veil across her face. And the man in the resurrection, the man is, is a god in the Mormon church. And he takes and he removes that veil from her face, from her grave, and he calls her name, and she is resurrected. That's why Mormon women want their husbands to be Mormons, good Mormons. Because they will never get out of the grave. They have no eternal life without their husband. No eternal life. Verse number 13. And the one having an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. New Jerusalem shall be a satellite to the earth like a moon. It's going to be approximately 1,500 miles, about 1,500 miles, about 1,500 miles. Not, no nation. No people have been able to build a satellite 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles and keep it from crashing. Only our Lord and Savior would be able to do that. Now let me go back and read these verses to you from the New American Standard Bible. And the angel, and to the angel, or the pastor of the church in Philadelphia, right? He who is holy, who is true, he who has the key of David and opens, and no one shall shut. And who shuts, and no one has the power to open. I know your deeds, I know your works, I know what you do. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no man can shut, because they have a little power. And have kept my word, and have not defiled or denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, to lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to bow down at your feet, and they shall know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my preservation, perseverance, I shall also keep you from the hour of testing and tribulation. The hour which is about to come upon the whole inhabited world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have in order that you may not lose your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. And the new Jerusalem, it comes down out of heaven from God and my new name. Adonai Ha'adonaim says that. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Our Heavenly Father, I send this message out. Father, I pray that you touch people's heart with your word, because your word is powerful. Mine isn't. Father, use your word to touch lives, touch hearts, touch souls, and to save souls. And Father, I pray for my students all over the world that listen so faithfully. Many of them I don't even know because they've never revealed themselves to me. But those that I know, I appreciate as my children. Thank you, Father, for the children you've given me to watch over and nourish. Help me to guard them in your word and with your word. Father, thank you for the, all of those people that died down to the ages that we may have your word today. And I know you have rewarded them for faithfully giving their lives and their children's lives for the sake of your word and your life and your light. Father, forgive me where I fail you, I pray. In Jesus' name I pray.